this afternoon. Um, Dr. Lewis Hoffman from the US, he's going to be speaking first on existential therapy, multiculturalism, and social justice. And after that, I'll introduce <coughs> our second speaker. Um, I don't need to say a great deal because um, Dr. Hoffman is going to introduce himself, but I hope it's um, an enjoyable session for you. So over to yourself. Well, thank you for coming. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm an existentialist, and existentialists are known for playing around with time, so uh, maybe it's appropriate that we're starting a little bit late here. When uh, Joel asked me to come to the conference and, and speak on multiculturalism and social justice, I have to admit my first reaction was some hesitation, because it's a, a little bit um, different for someone who is a cisgender white male to be presenting on this topic in some ways, and so there were were certain hesitations that I had. But what I'm gonna start off with doing is rooting a little bit of what drew me to this uh, in my, my own story here. This is what I'm gonna try to cover hopefully today. And I'm gonna be drawing heavily from a book, Humanistic Approaches to Multiculturalism and Diversity, that is coming out this fall, edited by myself, uh, my wife, Dr. Heather Lynn Clare, who's here, Nathaniel Granger, and David St. John. And uh, just as a disclaimer in starting, I am from the United States, and I'm going to draw upon some examples from the United States. I believe from what I've ex heard as I've traveled around that these are examples that are fairly well recognized around the world, but I will give them some context, particularly ones that may not be quite as familiar for me. I grew up in rural Iowa. This is the town where I grew up, and that, that's pretty much it. It's, it was not a very big town. And they say that there's 500 people. I, I think they were including the dogs and cats in that, that count. It was a small town, and where I grew up, it was pretty much assumed that you don't question God, and you don't question the American dream. And if you're not familiar with the idea of the American dream, the American dream is the idea that everyone has the same opportunities at, at wealth, at economic success, at happiness. And of course there's a lot of evidence that that dream is really maybe more of a delusion at times because it's not accurate and I'll, I'll speak to that some. In this little town and the communities around it, there was almost no diversity. I went to college then, also in a small rural community with very little diversity. And from there, I moved here. To, at age 23, I moved to Los Angeles. And a very different experience during my five years in Los Angeles. And two of those years lived in a largely predominant Latinx community. And this really helped to shape me in a lot of ways through developing a lot of close friendships and relationships with people from different cultural backgrounds. There was one in particular that stood out to me that I want to talk about a little bit. I worked at a psychiatric hospital while I was going through graduate school. I started off on an adult unit and then switched to an adolescent unit after, for the last year that I was there. There was a young man uh, who was in the hospital that I, when I started on the adolescent unit, he came back on. And I had seen him a number of times when I had worked on the, adolescent, or in the adult unit. So I recognized him. I'd heard some people mention him a few times and was aware that he was seen as a, an intelligent kid and, and overall a really good kid, but he'd come back to the hospital a few times. And so this first time that I had the opportunity to work with him, it was in a group setting, and it just happened to be there was a very low census this day. There was him and one other person in the group. And the other person, as was often the case, was very heavily medicated as first coming into the hospital and not able to communicate at all at the time. So I got an opportunity to speak with him. And I just asked, said, why, you know, why do you keep coming back here? What's going on? And he was pretty resistant and irritated, and rightly so, that this stranger coming in, and particularly a white male coming in, asking these things as if I would be able to have his solutions. And after a little bit of prodding, he decided to, to go ahead and, and tell me his story. He said he grew up in a rough neighborhood with a lot of violence, a lot of poverty and he was determined to get out. A lot of people in his neighborhood didn't get out. Either because of poverty they couldn't get out and there was a shocking number who didn't survive their adolescence and were killed beforehand because of the violence in the community. 
His goal and his path to get out was through college. That was his commitment. And he knew that getting in trouble could impact that. So he tried very hard to stay out of trouble. As he got older, people would come up and front him in school, get up in his face and challenge him to fight. But he didn't want to fight because he knew this would threaten his college. But he learned quickly that he had two options. He could fight there one-on-one, -on -one, and if he won, he'd earn their respect and they'd leave him alone for a little bit. Or he could avoid the fight. And then afterwards, this other person and his buddies would be looking for him. So he started off trying to sneak down the alleyways to get home. And didn't often make it. It was beaten up pretty bad a few times. So he decided that it was a better option to fight. And when he did fight, he'd win sometimes, he'd lose sometimes. If he won, he was generally given the option of he can go to juvenile hall or he could go to the hospital. And so he chose to come to the hospital. So he told me this story the whole time, no eye contact, looking down at the floor. And then he just looked up at me and said, so doc, what should I do? All I could say is I'm glad you're here. It was a very powerful story for me in recognizing that the American dream wasn't for everyone. Now a few years later, I met and married a woman from the Bahamas. At this time, in the community that we were living, there was a lot of violence against biracial couples, or at least there was some noticeable violence against biracial couples, including uh, an individual who had been stabbed, and a client that I had who told me about some of these experiences, and he was a black male dating a white woman, and he told me about the looks that he would get, and the fear that he had being out in public off, and because of the looks that he'd get, and the things that would be said to him started to become aware that being in a biracial relationship would likely influence many of the decisions that we would make as a family later about where we felt safe to live and where we would feel safe to raise our three biracial sons. When my oldest son was born, it was during the time that Obama was running for president. And when Obama was elected, there's a lot of talk, again, about this idea of a, a post-racial society, this celebration that we had overcome racism and we no longer had to worry about this. And so my son was born at a time of a lot of optimism in ways. But there was also another story that was going on. In 2012, Trayvon Martin was killed. This was something that had a profound impact on me. Trayvon Martin was 17 years old, living in Florida, and he went out one night for a snack. As he was walking home, wearing a hoodie, there was someone in the community that was part of the community neighborhood watch that viewed him as suspicious because he was black and wearing a hoodie and didn't look like he belonged. A story that my son's know is going to apply to them a lot throughout their life, that they're going to be people who think they don't look like they belong. And even in our neighborhood today, we have this little notification system, and when there's children of color that go around selling things door to door, they're much more likely to be viewed as suspicious, so we know this is going to apply to them. But so this individual, George Zimmerman, followed him, uh, chose to take a gun with him when he followed Trayvon initiated contact, a dialogue with Trayvon that led to an altercation. And we don't know except through Zimmerman's eyes what happened from there, except that we know that Trayvon Martin was shot and killed. And a little bit later, when George Zimmerman was on trial, he was found not guilty. And he was set free to continue to be violent in many other places. Tamir Rice, a few years later, he was even younger. He was 12 years old. He was in a park playing with a toy gun. A neighborhood noti neighbor noticed this and called the police and said that there was someone looking suspicious, looked like they had a gun, maybe a toy gun, in the park. And the police came. And you can watch this video online. If you watch it, it's, it's disturbing, but it's powerful. You see the police car driving off the street up on the grass in a very high speed, stopping very quickly by Tamir and within seconds shot him, and he died. His young sister was there, 
not allowed to come up to him, and they were slow to even offer him help. And this police officer, once again, was not, did not have repercussions, was not found guilty for the killing of this boy, weaponless boy, 12 years old, who was viewed as a threat. Now, research has shown that in the United States, black boys are viewed as being three to four years older than what they actually are. They often have labels of being scary and dangerous attached to them, whether or not they're doing anything that justifies that label. And I've seen this with clients that I've worked with as well. After the verdict where George Zimmerman was found not guilty, I remember, I remember very clearly where I was standing. I remember the notification coming up on my phone and reading the not, ver not guilty verdict. And I screamed out something in exasperation. I remember it clearly because it startled Heather Lynn. And she came and asked what was wrong, and I told her. One of the things that I have learned to do in my life to deal with a lot of suffering is one of the first places I turn is poetry. Poetry has been one of my best therapists. And starting around this time, I also began to see it as a, a tool for social justice as well. And so I wrote a poem. And in this poem, I was imagining my sons in this situation. I want to share that poem with you. And these are my three sons. The poem is titled, My Imperfect, Perfect Son. My imperfect, perfect son, why did you go walking down there that fateful night? You know better. You know the rules. Why did you wear those clothes? If you dress like that, you better be prepared to act accordingly. Why did you get angry? Why did you, didn't you submit, my imperfect, perfect son? Why? Why are we left now grieving after so many wrongs? My imperfect, perfect son, why did you go walking down there that faithful night? You know the rules are different for you. Some freedoms in this great country you still don't have. My imperfect, perfect son, why did you wear those clothes, those innocent clothes? They do not mean the same thing on you as they do on a white man of a certain appearance, though they serve the same purpose in the chilly night air. My imperfect, perfect son, why were you so scared? And why were you suspicious of this man who approached you with a gun? And why did you let these fears and suspicions show as anger? You know your fears will be dismissed while the aggressors will be perceived as real. You know your suspicions are not seen as valid as a man who chose in advance to hold the gun. You know your anger is never seen as justified because of the color of your skin. You're just a child, but you will be expected to be the bigger man. My imperfect, perfect son, why did you think you could live in this world with the freedoms others enjoy without question? You are not free, my son, as our freedom is only within, and how we will respond to the injustices that constitute this world in which we live. My imperfect, perfect son, why are we left grieving another of so many wrongs another tragedy befallen on our community. But know, my son, that this wrong will not be forgotten. That this wrong will inspire. In this wrong, we will find our inner freedom. And in this wrong, we will speak out, we will scream out, and we will not stop until this inner freedom is matched in the world we must live. first lines of this poem were taken as near quotes 
and some actual quotes that I heard from people most identified as humanistic and existential psychologists. That really struck me, that people that are in this field would respond in this way, justifying the killing that George Zimmerman forbade. And much of the rest of the poem was my own looking through it, wrestling through it, thinking about my own sons, and if they were in the same position, and how would they react? If I was in such a position, how might I act? I couldn't blame them for being scared. I couldn't blame them for being upset. I couldn't blame them for trying to protect themselves from this older, larger aggressor. Recently in the United States, we've had the election of Donald Trump, and this has been talked about in many presentations already at this conference. Since this time, there's been an increase in hate incidents directed at people from marginalized groups. There's been an increase in membership in hate groups. And Colorado, where we live, has seen some of the largest increase in the membership in hate groups. We've seen increased racist graffiti on sidewalks, in bathrooms, in stores, on tombstones, in schools. And we've seen an increase in hate incidents in cities after Trump rallies. This is not much of a surprise if you listen to the things that he says and the way that he says them. The United States still perceives itself quite often as the moral pillar of the world. But the reality is, we lost the moral compass if it ever really was in place. As we see these hate incidents rises, and as we see things such as these detention centers that are in the news now, where children are being separated from their parents in these overcrowded detention centers. What I've witnessed as a therapist, and I know my wife has witnessed this as well as a psychologist and many other colleagues that I've spoken with, is that there are more people coming into therapy because of being traumatized by world events, such as the killing of Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, fear of deportation, being afraid to leave their home because of racism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia being negatively impacted by the news, conflict with family members over political and or social justice issues. These are common things. At one time, it was rare that I knew where most of my clients stood politically. Right now, I know where every one of my clients stands politically because of the way that it is impacting them. I have clients that are Trump supporters. I have clients that are afraid to leave their home. These are both realities, and all are impacted. In the United States, we see significant healthcare disparities. One of them that, we see this in the mental health and the physical health world. In the, the physical health world, one of them that stands out is that black people are perceived as having a higher tolerance for pain. They're seen as being more likely to be med-seeking, and they're given fewer pain medication prescriptions. Their pain is taken less seriously, so they're forced to live in more physical pain. It's hard for people in poverty and people in marginalized groups to find good mental health care. And many of the clients that I've seen that are from marginalized groups talk about the experiences of microaggressions, racism, and homophobia that they've experienced with other therapists before coming. And they have difficult trusting me, obviously. And it makes sense. Even though I am very intentional about working with these clients. I'm gonna shift now to talk a little bit about my own identity. Part of my identity is as a privileged white male. This is part of who I am. No matter how much I try to distance myself from it, this is a reality that I have to live with and I have to be aware with. But there's also a collective aspect to my identity that's developed over time. 
My identity is deeply rooted in being part of a biracial family. I think it's important to pause here for just a second and note that there, we often see individualism and collectivism as these binary orthogonal constructs, but there, in reality, are many forms and many blends of individualism and collectivism. And for me, I have my own blend that becomes part of being this family. But being a father of biracial children, being a husband of a black wife, is a deep part of my identity, and it affects me every day of my life. My privilege allows me to be blind and escape, and there's times that I do this. I'm not proud of that, but there's times that I do this. When things feel too much, I can go out anywhere and not have to worry about my safety, not have to think about things. My wife, my sons, they don't have that same privilege, and they pu push me to recognize that this is a privilege, and they cannot do the same. It is a privilege to not be impacted and not be outraged by what's happening in the world. Privilege is a protection from that. And I see people say this all the time and, and complain about the, how people are outraged about so many things, but it's a privilege to not be outraged. And it's an irresponsible use of one's privilege to not care and act. This is a wonderful quote from Paul Tillich that I think ties into this. The citizens of a city are not guilty of the crimes committed in their city, but they are guilty as participants in the destiny of humanity as a whole and in the destiny of their particular city. They are guilty not of committing the crimes of which their group is accused, but of contributing to the destiny in which these crimes happened. As a white male in the United States, I participate in systems of privilege every day. I can't help it. And that is a type of guilt that I carry. It's not a guilt necessarily for my specific actions, but because I cannot help but participate in these systems of privilege. I'm going to shift to talking a little bit about some criticisms of mainstream psychology and also of humanistic and existential psychology through a social justice lens. Some of the things that are common. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions to these. But it's very common in mainstream psychology in the United States, and I'm guessing this is true in many other countries, to frame mental health in a capitalistic lens as a commodity, very much in line with what Joel was talking about earlier. To tell us to focus on the individual and not really consider what the implications are of just focusing on the individual. To view our job as comforting the individual and helping them to adjust to the expectations of society and that adjust to the expectations of society is really profound. This is one of the ways that so much of psychology reinforces the, the norms and the, the dominant political perspective sometimes of societies, makes it hard to, to resist, to engage in some of these social justice movements. It tells us to state our priorities should be decreasing individual suffering and increasing individual happiness. And I think that's powerful in the wake of what Joel talked about earlier as well. And to believe our job, it is not our job to take on the system. As an example of that, a few years ago at the American Psychological Association annual convention, there was a Black Lives Matter protest in which there was a, a march and then a number of speakers who spoke. The American Psychological Association was asked to support this and they refused. The reason was they said, we do advocacy, not activism. Now, what's the difference there? It's a pretty gray line in a lot of ways. I think we could find ways to uh, try and expand that difference to justify it. But this was the APA's reason for not supporting this. And I think it is often used to avoid certain controversial issues. When we look at humanistic and existential psychology, it's easy to want to think that these are exceptions. But I think we need to begin with a critique of what we've done to support some of these problematic system, systems as well. Humanistic and existential psychology in the United States were among the first to espouse a valuing of diversity, but it has failed in actualizing this. A few examples. The emergence of these movements in the United States were around the time of the Civil Rights Movement. And while there certainly were humanistic and existential psychologists involved in the civil rights movements, 
Rarely did they connect it to their professional work. Rarely did they do it in those roles. So they were separate. Around the same time as the Society for Humanistic Psychology formed in the early days of humanistic psychology in the US, the Association of Black Psychology was also starting. Theopia Jackson talks about how there were many of the same criticisms being voiced by black psychologists as there were by humanistic psychologists. Yet these remain separate. And while, as Jackson points out, and she did the, the research going through the citations about this, while black psychology often cites humanistic psychology, it's rare that humanistic psychology cites black psychology. As the multi-psychology movement became popular in the United States, humanistic psychology was outside of that circle. And there were things that I heard often within humanistic psychology. Maybe the most common, common was, because we focus on each individual's lived experience, we don't have to consider diversity. Now there's ways this sounds right, but there's problems with this. And focus on the individual while often ignoring the systems of oppression. And when you hear people unpack this statement, that became more and more evident than not recognizing the systems of oppression that serve to promote some of these marginalizations. And we often cannot see difference without a lens to be able to recognize it. This requires some degree of knowledge and understanding of these cultural differences to be able to recognize it when it's there. In some ways, we can compare it to colorblind racism. Colorblind racism is that idea that I don't see color. If you don't see color, you don't see essential aspects of people's identity. You don't see my wife, you don't see my children. Bahamian identity is very much a part of who my wife is. And we want it to be very much a part of our son's lives as well. And the parallel is, we don't need to see color, is often what seems to be an implicit message espoused. There was discussion that being relational is really the same thing as collectivism. But there's important differences here. This doesn't take into consideration that aspect of identity. That in collectivism, it impacts our very identity, how we see who we are. By focusing on the individual, we often end up implicitly and unintentionally contributing to pathologizing people with collectivist identities. This can be done by seeing ways of connecting with one's culture as an avoidance of responsibility, when it may be a very intentional choice in some ways, a part of their identity. It's made more on a collective level. And this can be an excuse to not see or consider some of the systemic issues. And shifting to thinking about lessons, as therapists and counselors, if we do not look at our role in the broader system, we too often fall into the role of empowering and reinforcing oppression. And this is something that I think every therapist needs to take an inventory of. How are we unintentionally contributing to some of these systems at times? Martin Luther King in 1967 was invited to give an address to the American Psychological Association. And one of his themes in this talk was the idea of creative maladjustment. Uh, it, that's an existential idea, I think, if I've ever heard of one. It's a beautiful concept, creative maladjustment. It reminds me in some ways of something Ed Mendowitz uh, once said. He was talking about the differences in the way that uh, existential therapists in particular often approach therapy and looking at the, the bell curve that we're all familiar with and notes that while a lot of therapists, a lot of clients when they come in, they're on that outskirts of the bell curve. And what most of therapy tries to do is encourage people to move towards that vaulted norm, that idealized norm. He said, instead what we do often in existential psychology is help people become comfortable where they're at, maybe even feel comfortable to move further out on that tail. And that's what Martin Luther King is talking about in many ways too about being okay, being outside of what is considered the norm. Being okay taking on some of the norms, some of the systems that we see in place. I, I have learned in part from my 
16-year-old client slash teacher, and I think he would, became both to me in many ways, that not everyone is free, not in the same sense. Or maybe not all freedoms are equal. And we can make that distinction between personal freedom and political freedom. And that's a valid and important distinction. But these have implications. They do impact each other. And we need to keep those in consideration. We also need to, to think complexly about responsibility in these cultural contexts. Individual responsibility is not enough. We need to recognize collective identities and collective responsibility. And that collective responsibility, that's part of what Paul Tillich was talking about. Looking at those power structures and holding those structures responsible. When we see things that are happening in the world today that have many of these, these consequences. Some of the statements that I was reading last night, some of the things that I've heard from Boris Johnson, and uh, certainly do not know nearly as much about that as, as Trump, but boy, did it sound familiar to me. Looking at the, the implications of some of these statements and how that impacts people is, is quite powerful. When the, the, the famous tape of Trump in the, the bus making some very sexist statements about uh, abusing women, in essence, sexually assaulting women. The next couple weeks of therapy were quite powerful. Nearly every female client I saw was impacted by that. Some because they had experienced similar things. Some just because of the dehumanization, the stories, the recognition, but it impacted. And it was a popular theme in therapy. So we need to recognize some of the limitations in responsibility. And this is rooted in that recognition that not all freedoms are equal or equivalent. In existential therapy, we often emphasize that personal responsibility to the neglect of considering context, situational factors, and collective responsibility. And we would do well to consider both. It doesn't mean we need to no longer consider the individual responsibility, but we need to think broader. Cultural humility is a topic that's become very popular in the United States. The essence of this is that we can never know or understand another individual's experience. And we can never know, fully know or understand another's cultural experience either. There are some that feel like if they take a course on multicultural psychology, if they take a course or a certificate maybe on cultural competencies, that now they're a multiculturally competent therapist. But being culturally competent is always a process. And it's better, as Theo B. Jackson talks about, to talk about cultural competencies and to recognize that these are always in process. They're always evolving. And that can be tiring. I was just talking earlier this week about how it can be tiring sometimes to keep up with the changes in language with a lot of the multicultural literature. But it is important for us to be willing to do that. Sometimes what we ought to diagnose is the context, not the individual. I prefer to try and avoid diagnosis most of the time in general. There certainly are exceptions. But in looking at the context, and this can be a powerful way of framing it sometimes with clients. As the, excuse me, as the O.P. Jackson said, our children are not at risk. They are at potential in at-risk environments. This shift, I think, is a powerful shift. Lisa Vallejos, as well as some of her colleagues, have been emphasizing and talking a lot about building intentionally inclusive practices in existential and humanistic psychology. What is common to do, I've seen this in many organizations that I've been in, is putting some type of slogan or list of values and including diversity in there, and then thinking, all right, we've done our job. We've done what we're supposed to do. But just espousing diversity and expecting it to merge doesn't work. And for, in the United States, at least, a lot of 
people are from marginalized groups are now rightly suspicious of organizations that just state that they value diversity. We have to go further beyond that. This is true in our professional organizations and conferences. In the, the first Society for Humanistic Psychology conference, which was about 12 years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, I took some students along and they pointed out to me that uh, they, they did the math. I think it was 82% of the presenters were older white males. This has changed a lot over time, but it was through being very intentional. And we also need to do this with our clients and how we present ourselves as we try to attract clients to our practices. When we stop therapy, when the client leaves our office at the end of the 50 minute hour, we often fail our clients. This does not mean that we need to continue direct interactions with our client beyond the 50 minute hour. It's often rooted in contributing to a more just, more socially just mental health system and society. We can take these lessons we learn from our clients and we can help address the systems of oppression, the systems that, that promote the marginalization, contribute to it. It is through creating intentionally inclusive environments where clients from marginalized groups feel genuinely valued and safe. As we said in the beginning of the, the book on humanistic approaches to multiculturalism and diversity, we are suggesting that one cannot be multi multiculturally competent or proficient without engaging in advocacy and or activism beyond the therapy room. Roland May had noted that the purpose of psychotherapy is to set people free. If this is true, then we are compelled with some situations to engage beyond the therapy room and to recognize the complexities of freedom. We must recognize and see the individual barriers, the forms of systemic oppression that many therapists often neglect or refuse to see. It's important that we help clients recognize the options they have and how to respond to oppression, but respect their choices. At times, this may be pursuing meaning in the face of oppression through advocacy, activism, or various other pursuits to try and address these systemic wrongs. But other times, it may be finding ways to survive oppression while minimizing the negative impacts. One client that I work with, he was referred to therapy for anger issues at work. Well, his anger issues were because he was experiencing microaggressions and systemic oppression on a daily basis. And he was speaking out against these, and it was seen as being angry. So he was referred to therapy so that I could help him fall in that norm again, become submissive to an oppressive system. Uh, we talked about the options, and his choice was, I've got a wife, I've got children, I need this job, I can't risk those. So his choice was to survive the oppression, at least for the time being. But there was something meaningful in recognizing other options for him as well, that he didn't always see. There are times, this is one of my favorite pictures of my son, by the way, when his, one of his first times participating in a, a protest movement with us. If we are humble enough, we can use our knowledge as existential therapists as well as what we learn from our clients. And I like that part in particular, what we learn from our clients to be more effective and more powerful advocates beyond the therapy office. A few years ago, I worked with Nathaniel Ranger, Lisa Vallejos, and Michael Motes, and we wrote it one of the first academic articles on the Black Lives Matter movement. And part of what we spoke to in this is recognizing how thoughtful, non-reactive activism can be healing and connect with, with meaning. When you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, it is a great example of this. What happened at the start of this with Trayvon Martin, it was not anything new. It was something that had been going on in the United States for well beyond the civil rights movement and has never gone away. This is something that just wasn't spoke about. But bringing a voice to it, connecting with other people who had been through these experiences, finding ways to speak out against it and try to make changes, that was healing. Activism can be healing. Advocacy can be healing. For us, with our vicarious traumatization, as well as for our clients. And this speaks, I think, powerfully to the redemptive potential of suffering and anger. Anger often gets a bad rap, 
And I'm very grateful for Stephen Diamond. He's one of the people that has tried to redeem the value of anger. Certainly anger can be problematic at places, and we see that, but it also can be redemptive. Thank you. The, uh, if you're interested in the slides, they are up on ResearchGate. <coughs> Thank you.